Davis steps under center. Gibson and McClendon behind it. Davis with motion by Richard. Will get the ball to McClendon. He leaps. Oh, he doesn't get in. He fumbled the football. Carolina holds. The game is over. And Carolina has won the game. Ben lead to throw. Over the middle. Intercepted. Wolfuck again. Wolfuck the other way. At the 30. The 40. Wolfuck to midfield. Miles Wolfuck with the pick. The heels on the doorstep of an enormous victory. Left side of the line. Hood standing to Williams' is right. Williams going to throw. One-on-one. Davis has it. Touchdown. Carolina wins. Carolina is the Coastal Division champion. Bernard fields it at the 26. Heading to the far side. Gio at the 35. Gio, he's at the 50. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Gio is going to take it. for the possible win. Snap, spot, kick away, high enough, long enough. It's good! It's good! Carolina has won the game on a 42-yard field goal by freshman Hunter Burr. Good gosh, dirty. This is the Heel Tough Blog Hey guys, and welcome in to another edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. It's Anthony Pagnotta with you guys as always. And today we continue our off-season interview series with the former Tar Heels. And this time we go to a former offensive lineman and defensive lineman. Billy Spann stopped by with us earlier this week and talked to us about his career in Carolina. Now, one thing that we do want you to note is that we are going to put out two editions of this podcast, but one of these editions is explicit. The other one is not. Billy uh, was was very candid and uh, you know we, we, we loved it. It was a fantastic episode, but for some of those that may be listening, maybe some of our younger listeners or, or people with kids in the car, I just want you to make sure uh, we are going to have have you know one that is clearly labeled explicit while the other one will not be so make sure that you have the right edition pulled up right now and uh you know the first thing that we had to ask billy about his career at carolina is you know he came from the virginia beach area but how did he end up playing for bill dooley and the tar heels dooley was the first uh, acc coach that made recruiting a priority and he would come to your house and sit in your living room and just be very persuasive and and when he you know when he brought you down to chapel hill it was uh incredibly attractive and the team had just won the 71 72 acc championships they were um the best team in the acc when i signed in 73 and i had some guys with me brooks williams mike voigt um, guys from Tidewater that uh, I knew I wanted to spend, you know, my football career with, especially Boyd, uh, you know, and Brooks Williams, my best friend in high school. So Brooks and I were, were recruited together, sort of as a um, as a pair, and we were flown around to places in Lear Jets, like you know, South Carolina and Paul Dietzel and other places. And really, the only you know school that had me at at go was UNC and it was um the whole scene down there you know with uh, James Taylor and and the toughness of the team and and the beauty of the campus and how cool everything was and you know it being 73 um it was just the perfect time to be there and I spent 5 years there I came back every summer for five summer practices and and um it was the best time of my life uh you know i'm just happy i can say that i had that part of my life and went to cox and then unc i call that the golden ticket uh, cox then unc and i actually got a degree from the place and and everything <laughs> so mm-hmm. 
So, you know, you got the connection, like you mentioned, with, with Mike Boyd. You know, I think he's one of those guys that, you know, when you talk about the great Tar Heel running backs, I think everybody, of course, remembers Amos Lawrence. Everybody remembers Kelvin Bryant. Uh, you know, Mike Boyd's a guy that is, you know, right there with them in terms of numbers. But he doesn't seem to get talked about as much as some of those other guys. You know, first of all, what was that connection like that you two had? And, and why do you think that he's a guy that just doesn't get talked about as much? much of the other two guys? Well, the reason is when Mike was uh, playing at Miami, Dick Crum told the guys to break his leg or take him out when they were in a pile. And Mike heard Crum tell the guys to, you know, incapacitate him when they're in a pile, like poke his eye out or, you know, try to twist his ankle. And so Crum when the you know the year before he came to Carolina, we beat him up there in Miami, and uh, Dick uh, Crum, properly named, uh, wanted to take Mike out. And so when Mike was running for a touchdown, knowing that Crum was calling for his uh, illegal takeout, uh, as he's passing Crum on the sideline running the ball for a touchdown, he flips him the bird right in his face. And so when Crum came to Carolina, he wanted to erase every every uh, picture off the wall. Came down every you know anything related to Mike was erased. You know you know, and uh, so that's part of why Mike Mike's legacy is not as it should be. And I can tell you one thing: when Mike was at Florida and we beat the Gators, he got hit in the chest so hard his sternum was cracked cracked in half in the sternum from a blow to the chest from a face mask by a gator in a game we won. And when he came back from there, uh, he literally had a cracked sternum, and he played the rest of the season several more games with a donut, a pad in the shape of a donut strapped to his sternum. And if he would have been hit one more time like that, he would have been dead on the field from the bones piercing his heart of a cracked sternum. That's how tough Mike Voigt was. And Mike Voigt eventually died from the damage to his heart uh, early in his life. And uh, I can tell you that Mike was my best friend. Mike was the heart, the soul, and the spirit of Carolina. Him and, and Boom Boom Betterson, when they combined in 74 to win uh, and do what we did, we had them both going over a grand. And that offensive line with Ken Huff and, um, you know, Rusnak and those guys, I mean, we had the best offensive team in the history of college football. No one had ever gotten two guys from the same, you know, tailback spot at a grand each ever. And, uh, you know, Mike did that, and Mike was the best friend a man could have. And he was the best friend to dozens of, of students and regular students. And our team, we loved Mike. Uh, we called him the Space Cowboy because uh, when he first came in as a freshman, he kept playing the, the Steve Miller song over and over, you know, about the Space Cowboy. And and if you listen to that song, you it's really Mike's song. You know, Mike lives today, and his spirit is, is still powerful. And um, he is someone that uh, I have never known a guy like Mike Boyd. He was the toughest guy I've ever known. And... Um, it was just I played against him in uh, in high school when he was at Indian River. He came over and he was some for some reason he was playing quarterback. Mike couldn't see very good, you know. He never caught a pass. He never really caught a pass at Carolina. But um, I can tell you one thing: that guy, uh, his spirit is so strong, and his love for Carolina and his devotion literally cost him his life. But uh, he didn't back down when he when his sternum was cracked. He didn't sit on the sidelines or sit out. He played right through the rest of the season with a cracked sternum. And and uh, when people think about toughness, I just want them to think of the Space Cowboy because that man was uh, was awesome, and he was my best man at my wedding. Uh, when I married Melanie, like uh, 20 years ago, uh, he came over, and, and so did Brooks William uh, Brooks. And Mike Boy drove right up on the lawn and parked his girlfriend's uh, stingray on my lawn and walked in late. And then we proceeded to get married with Mike being there. So uh, we love him a lot. Can't say enough about the guy, really. So thanks for asking. 
Of course, man. He sounds like a guy that I would have loved to hang out with as well. Man, that is uh, that is crazy, some of the stuff there. Um, yeah, I mean, look, you know, the Space Cowboy wasn't the only guy that was a little bit underrated when it came to the legacy of the guys that were there during your time. You know, when you talk about the head coaches in Carolina history, I feel like, you know, everybody, of course, turns and talks about Mac Brown and his legacy. And, you know, he's only continuing to build that here in his second go-around. But, you know, it doesn't feel like – you hear, you hear as much about Bill Dooley as you do about Coach Brown and, and, and even Coach Crum. You know, when you, you look at the legacy that Coach Dooley left behind, you know, what, what is the thing that you remember most uh, about him and, and from your time being there? You know, what, what are those things that always will stick with you about him? Well, the 71-72 championships – were incredible. Uh, the 77 championship when Lawrence Taylor came in as a freshman and I was a fifth year senior and I was moved over to the nose guard spot. That defense that year held the opposing team to less than seven points a game for the 11 regular season games. That was probably the best defense in the history of North Carolina, maybe rivaled by one or two. The one with Julius Peppers was pretty amazing, but um, Dooley won three ACC championships, and then Crum came in, and uh, Crum got a fourth one. And those are the only four to ever win, and they're all four related to Dooley because all the good guys on that Crum team in 80 were, uh, you know, Dooley boys. You know, we call ourselves Dooley boys because we were his boys. He was our, our daddy, Daddy Duels, and we were his sons, and he wanted us to have fun and win and be tough. And when you think of toughness, um, I can tell you that uh, when I came in there in 73 and I signed, it was so rough that Bill Wicks, before I signed on my recruiting trip, the, the, before I left, he sat me on a bed right there in his in his dorm, and I, he had Holly Davis and Holly Corte next to him, his girlfriend. And, and Billy, Billy Wicks told me, look, I'm your host. I want to tell you, this is the toughest thing you're ever going to do. We had a guy die, Bill Arnold, a couple of years ago. Um, you can die at practice. You will be near death. You will. You could die. And if you die, I want you to. T- I want you to know. I uh, sat here and told you that that was possible. So don't blame me if you die because this shit's so tough. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? I want to be a winner. I want to be with you and these guys, like uh, Ken Huff and Robert Pratt and Ron Rusnak and you know um, those guys that won those two ACC championships. Did it through their sheer toughness, like the Sun Bowl and the eleven and one season of seventy two with. Timmy Kirkpatrick and and uh, Billy Height and uh, Mike Mansfield and Jim Webster and John Bunning. I can tell you that there was a time when we were as tough as Oklahoma or Texas or any of those schools. No one did it as rough and tough as we did. Dooley would take you at practice so hard, you would literally be on the brink of just what Bill Wicks told me about death, you know, and it had a metallic taste when you got close and it was after all the sweat was gone to your, from your body. And you were just thinking that in one more second, you were just going to croak. And I, we, he probably pushed me in five years and my guys with me, we probably hit that mark about between 20 to 30 times we were near death and, and then, but he knew that if he pushed you that hard to practice, the game would be a breeze. If you look at Michael Jordan's quote, I've seen recently that, um, pr- you know, I practice so hard the, that the games were a joy and easy. Well, we practice so hard the games were a breeze, easy, and uh, no problem for us. And we had no fear. We didn't let the other team intimidated us. No one had practiced tougher than us. And I'm so proud of my guys, and I still am. And and it really was about taking all fear and all doubt away. You know, Captain Ahab and Moby Dick, if you look at Gregory Peck, the reason he was able to get those men to follow him around the world on a ship to chase a white whale was that he showed them that he had no fear. Duly taught us to not fear. Don't fear what people tell you. Don't fear what's in your head. Don't fear the enemy. Just go forward and win and dominate and make that other guy in front of you give up. And we were 
bad, bad, bad men. But we were Dooley's boys. When we were on the field, we were the most badass guys in football. And, you know, we played against guys like Randy White, you know, uh, Ohio State, uh, Cornelius Green, Archie Griffin, um, you know, Joe Montana, Tony Dorsett. And we whooped their ass. You know, we never got it handed to us. The worst defeat we had was at Ohio State when I was up there. We played against Cornelius Green and Pete Johnson and Archie Griffin when Archie just won the Heisman Trophy. We went went to the horseshoe and, um, you know, they only beat us 33 to 14 or something. We were close at the half. It was like within seven points and they'd been drinking the whole night before. They were hammered smelling like beer and everything and playing games until mid-morning. You know, I mean, they were wild guys up there at Ohio State and Finally, they sobered up in the second half and kicked us pretty hard. But, shit, man, those guys were the best. We played against the best. We played against Notre Dame when Joe Montana made his debut. You know, you probably heard about that. And Brooks Williams had the chance to win it at the end, and Billy Pascal got sacked and couldn't get the ball to Brooks in the end zone. And uh, we could have, you know, won that game. But it was Joe Montana's time to do what he did, and he – he did it against us in 75 there. And um, so what I remember about Dooley is <clears throat> he'd be sitting there before a game, you know, and he'd sit on this table, the trainer's table, amongst all of us, and he'd be sm- smoking a cigarette, just sitting there, kind of dangling his feet, just with this look of calm on his face. And we'd be waiting for the door to open, to run out on the field. And we would look at Dooley. I would look at him and I'd stand near him and I would gather from him this calmness, you know, this assurity that we were the prepared ones. We were the ones who had sacrificed. We were the ones who had lost a man, Billy Arnold, doing this. I mean, when when Billy died, it was was rough. We took a big hit in recruiting because people literally told us, if you go there, you could, you know, uh, you could fucking die. And um, anyway, I, I slept in Billy's bed when I got there. I was a right guard like him. People would walk in my room that saw me sitting on my bed, and they'd look at me, and they'd go, that's Billy's bed. And i go, I'm a right guard like Billy, too. And, um, you know, um, at Carolina, we were tough. We we knew what we were facing, and we were we had rose to the challenge, and we knew it was worth it. We had 56 guys come in there in uh, 72. When I came in, there was no limit on how many guys could get a scholarship. So there was 56 of us. And and let me tell you, um, Dooley motivated you by looking at you and tell, telling you, you're going to win, you're going to have fun, this is going to be the most awesome thing. I mean, he wouldn't really tell you how much fun you were going to have. You just did the, you just had the fun. When we went downtown and we walked down there from Erring House to the, to the Franklin Street, we had the most fun anybody ever had. I mean, probably in the history of Carolina. And we did it because um, we earned it. We earned the fun we had. We earned everything, every bit of fun we had. We earned it. And when we won, people loved it. And the town lit up. And we would win those games, literally, to just bring joy to all our fellow classmates and students and all the people who were rooting for us. We knew that when we won, it would be our town. The state would be ours, and so would the state that we beat. And I learned that in Virginia Beach at Cox, if we would beat First Colonial at Cox, as I did my senior year, for sure, we owned the beach, we owned all the bars, we owned all the women, they were ours. That beach was ours. And so at Carolina, when we beat South Carolina or Florida, we owned that state, we owned all everybody in there, and we owned, that was ours, that that turf, that land became ours. And so we, we conquered by, uh, you know, uh, the joy of winning, and winning brings a lot of uh, collateral rewards, if you know what I mean. So, yeah. Yeah, well, you got did a lot of winning there for sure. Um, and, you know, look, you, you were, you know, part of that winning, of course, 
you know, when in your final season on campus, you mentioned it a little bit, that 77 season was special. You know, you actually moved from, you know, the offensive line to the defensive line. What was behind that move, and, and what do you remember? Did Coach Dooley come and approach you? No, you know, what it, I'll tell you. I'll be honest with you. Pat Watson was my coach for four years, and he was a taskmaster. Pat was a guard like Dooley, you know, at uh, at Mississippi, and Pat was a bad, bad, bad man, a badass, just a tough guy. I mean, he would literally take us and um, drill us so hard. Uh, it was a it, we were machines. We were offensive bulldozers. Um, I mean, look at who we produced. We produced the greatest offensive lineman in the history of Carolina, which is Ken Huff and Robert Pratt and Ron Rusnak, All-American at 218 pounds. And, uh, you know, um, Pat was very intimidating, and he died recently when he was coaching for Vince Dooley uh, down there uh, you know, at Georgia. And the night he died, we were so close. Uh, the night he died, um, after a win for Georgia, I sat up all night and I thought about him. I didn't know he died, but I was thinking of how great he was and the great offensive line schemes and our, our dominance as linemen. And I thought of it all night long, and I couldn't sleep. And I woke up and I got a paper that morning, and I it, I read that he had died while I'm thinking of him all night long. So Pat and I were very close, and I, I love Pat, and especially his widow, his wife, who um, you know we 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 love. Uh, his family but pat would smack you in the head with the heel of his hand in your ear hole and ring your bell hard or he'd chase you from behind if you screwed up and i literally learned oh you know while i'm on the field to look for his shadow coming up behind me so i could duck so he wouldn't so i wouldn't get smacked in the ear hole and uh pat would put some heavy hands on you. and guy that's what guys did back then so what happened was um, right before I, you know my final time with Pat he went to smack my head with a left hook to my ear hole and I threw my right arm up and blocked his hand just before it smacked me in the ear and I stared him down like dude that's the last time you touch me you do it again I'll fucking kill you and uh, basically at that point, I was transferred over to the defense to Tom Harper, and I was in the defensive line with you know Lawrence Taylor and the wonderful coach named Tom Harper, who was who won a national championship with uh, Danny Ford over there at Clemson. Once Dooley went to Tech, um, Tom became the defensive lineman for Danny and won the national championship by paying guys a hundred thousand dollars in a bag cash. <laughs> and Tom would hand him the money and Danny would say, that's supposed to be me handing the high school guy the, the cash in the bag. Anyway, they all got in trouble for that. But Tom Harper is, I love Tom so much. Tom Harper, we were lucky to have some, some coaches like John Guy, uh, Tom Harper, Billy Height, Mike Mansfield. These guys were so cool to be with. I mean, what kept you from quitting at Carolina was that you knew you were with the finest men in the world. The coaches, even though they were crazy sons of bitches and, you know, liked to beat on us, we didn't care. We could take any pain. They taught us to take pain and do your job and, you know, shut the hell up and get it done. And then when you go out on town, it's your town. When you beat that team over there, that's your state. And uh, so we own a lot of states. You know, there are states still. Florida, South Carolina, <laughs> those are our places. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's crazy what you when you go through hard times. Uh, you got lots of good memories, and I appreciate you letting me tell these stories. Uh, thanks, Anthony. Yeah, definitely, man, definitely. You know, one of the things that I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, just a couple more questions here with uh, Billy Spann, the former Tar Heel offensive and defensive lineman here on the Heels Up Walk podcast. You know. One of the main focuses when Mac Brown came back in 2018 was to reestablish some of the connections with some of the former players. You know, as a former player, have you kind of noticed an, an effort from Mac Brown to reach out to you and some of the other guys uh, that are former players and, and sort of get you guys back into the mix and create sort of that family environment that the basketball program has? Oh, yeah, because, you know, it's Carolina. You know, we're a family. And, um, you know, just like 
That's how it is. You know, we're family with, uh, like, Tommy Lagarde, Walter Davis. You know, Walter was, uh, you know, the uh, uncle for uh, Hubert. You know, Walter was my best friend. Um, uh, those guys, um, Tommy Lagarde, he owns the Hall River Ballroom. Um, you know, we're a family, and it goes cross sports. You know, the wrestlers, the basketball players, you know, um, those guys and us and Mac Brown, you know, the University of North Carolina is about one thing. It's about winning and winning, uh, solves a lot of problems. I mean, uh, Mac Brown, we're so happy to have him. He, he loves us. We love him. He's, he's family. He's like, you know, our grandpa. And you know, the funny thing is, is, uh, you know, guys like Jim Don and, and, you know, all these guys, they're, you wouldn't believe the, how good it feels to have this big of a family. <laughs> you know, uh, it's amazing. It's just, uh, you know, you. It, I would say to young people, um, find something you love doing with a bunch of people that are going to, you know, you're going to love being with. And do something that's hard, that's painful, that uh, pushes you to the limit. And then do it to the best of your ability. And if you do it when you're young, when you're old, you have so many great memories. I'm 66 right now, and I've got the best memories of any anybody I know in, in the whole world because of my Carolina experience. And and um, and it keeps going. We're going to throw a huge party next year. We threw a party uh, in 17 for the 40-year reunion. We had a big championship party at the Blue Zone. We had 150 guys, and and we did some some stuff that those guys will never forget. And just having friends like this is worth every ounce of pain and and uh, suffering we went through to have friends like this. I'll, you know, it's a there's nothing like it. So you know, the last question that I'll ask you, uh, you know, before we let you go is, man, you know, you have done some crazy things. You know, not only you know with your Tario family, but even you know after your career in Chapel Hill, you moved on, and you know I saw a bunch of these different photos of you down in Mexico. You said uh, you know earlier that you uh, you know during COVID were traveling uh, to Montana and Idaho, all these different places. So you know, where has life taken you after you know your football career, and and what are the some of the some of the things that you've been getting into, man, because it seems like you definitely are uh, living a wide-open lifestyle, and uh, it's probably presented some very interesting memories for you. Well, Carolina and the football, you know, experience taught me to uh, to not really have any fear, and and I realized that if you go out there and do what you want, I took a, a scuba course from Ken Orso, the gym coach, my last year at Took us, you know. I took a scuba class, and and I went underwater in the woolen gym pool, and I, I that's all I wanted to do was go underwater, and so, and be a diver, and I kind of watched sea hunt as a kid, and and then I um, got my diploma, I went down to Gitmo in uh, Guantanamo Bay to be a carpenter, and dove eighty times in the Windward Passage, and then went to Jamaica and saw the life of the scuba instructor with the way it is in you know Jamaica in the pool with well beautiful for women and everything, teaching them how to dive. So, I be, you know, I became an explorer, a sea captain, a dive instructor, and and I went all over the world diving, Tonga, Caribbean, Mexico, Hawaii. Um, I became a uh, sea captain, an explorer, and a uh, guy who could teach scuba diving and make a buck on a boat or underwater, and um, that kind of led me to uh, 15 years in Hawaii after in two years in Cozumel and sailing all over the Baja and everything. But, I mean, um, the thing is, um, do what you want to do. My mom had one piece of advice to me when she when I would say, what should I do with my life? She would say, just be happy. And I found happiness in nature, you know, in underwater and jungles and beaches and mountains and I climbed Mount McKinley a couple of times I got up there pretty high on McKinley at 18,600 feet then I took my wife up there a couple of years later and and I, I would just tell people to enjoy the wild places and find the wild places you want and then maybe figure out whether you're going to be a ski instructor or a scuba instructor or you know a mountain guide or some uh, some you know the world is a big place and don't bother yourself into doing what people tell you or what 
you think, uh, you know, somebody wants you to do, do what you want to do as a, as a human. And, 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 you know, if, if you have half a life that I had, I, she will have one great life. I'm, I'm very appreciative of my parents. I was born to some special parents that allowed me to, um, understand the, the beauty and the wonderment of life. And, and, um, so I, I'm just blessed and, and grateful. And, and thanks for letting me share these these things with you, Anthony. It, it's awesome, man. I'm going to be honest with you. You know, I, I love doing these. And, you know, there's there's always, you know, you know some of the guys that we talk to, and, and we have some of these quick interviews. But I love these types of interviews. I love these ones where, you know, you tell us all these great stories. Um, you know, one of the ones that stuck out to me last year was Scott Stankavich, very similar to you, told just a bunch of different stories and everything like that. I mean, look, there, there are so many stories that it seems like we haven't even gotten to. So we're definitely going to have to have you back. You know, we're going to be doing this going forward pretty much every off season. So we'll definitely have to get you back on. Uh, thanks for stopping by with us, though, man, and uh, telling some of these stories. Uh, it, it was great. I hope, uh, you know, some of the some of the listeners enjoy it as much as I did. But uh, yeah, thanks for taking some time with us, man, because uh, you definitely, like you said, you you have lived a great life, man, and, and thanks for sharing part of it with us. Well, go Hills, and I appreciate what you're doing, Anthony, and I look forward to talking to you again sometime. And, you know, i got lots of friends if you need other guys to interview. You just let me know who you want to reach out to. I can think of uh, some guys like Boom Boom Betterson who uh, you would love to interview and some other uh, characters that are super cool like Boom Boom. So you just let me know and how I can help, okay? And thank you again. All right. We'll definitely do that. Thank you so much, Billy, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, man? Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. There you go. Billy Spann. I want to thank him for swinging by with us. Uh, great stuff there, guys. Uh, just some great stories. Always love those types of guys that come on and uh, really want to talk about, you know, in, in depth about some of the experiences that they had on campus. Uh, and Billy will definitely be a guy that we are going to have on uh, sometime down the line to continue some of those great stories because it feels like we only just got started hearing some of those stories that he has to tell. So, uh, you know, look, this is, uh, as we mentioned, this is part of a series. So if you missed the first edition, uh, you got another former offensive lineman, Pat Crowley, who stopped by with us uh, earlier this week as well. That one uh, is up currently as well. Make sure you guys go back, check that one out. Uh, there's going to be a ton of other guys that are hopefully going to be stopping by with us. As of right now, we've got two other guys that are scheduled. We're kind of going to go week by week and and sort of send out you know feelers to a group of guys because we don't want them stacking up too much to where we're you know bogged down. Uh, you know, do I, I do have a job, so it, it is a little bit tough sometimes to be able to carve out some of these times so you know I'm trying not to load it up to the point where I'm going to over schedule or schedule guys on top of each other so we're spreading it out a little bit we're also going to give you guys a little bit of time we're spreading the episodes out a little bit to give you guys you know a little bit of time to be able to listen to uh, you know one edition and, and get yourself prepared for the next edition uh, also we'll give us some downtime in case we have to update you on some of the recruiting stuff that's going on but uh, we got plenty of guys coming up over the weekend. Uh, I'm going to be talking to uh, two former Tar Heel defensive backs, uh, Kendrick Burney from the uh, late 2000s teams, of course, under head coach uh, Butch Davis at the time. He's going to stop by and talk to us, as well as uh, Errol Hood is going to stop by, of course, a, a guy that uh, was brought to campus by Mac Brown and then eventually uh, was a part of the group that uh, was under and then eventually played under then replacement head coach, soon to be full time head coach Carl Torbush, until he finished up his career at Carolina in 2001. So we're going to talk to him. And uh, as we mentioned, plenty of other guys that will be coming up. Another thing that we're going to be doing, of course, this offseason, something that we've done the last few off seasons, really outside of last year with all the uncertainty and then the eventual schedule change, is we are going to be talking to a lot of the guys that participate in magazine season. Uh, that sort of get you guys prepared, not only when it comes to the Tar Heels, but nationally. Uh, Bill Bender of the Sporting News, I uh, just talked to him actually uh, today of recording on uh, WFNZ in Charlotte. So we're going to go in-depth with him on the Tar Heels. He's going to stop by with us again uh, sometime uh, later on this summer. You got, uh, hopefully, Stephen Lassen of Athlon Sports. We've had him on plenty of times before. Uh, he is now a full-time co-host of the Cover 2 podcast. 
podcast uh, that Athlon Sports produces as well. So hopefully we'll be able to get him on to talk a little bit about where they have Carolina. They also had a great Q&A uh, with Sam Howell, the quarterback for the Tar Heels. Uh, that's something that if you guys haven't seen that, go to your local newsstands, pick it up. I'm uh, definitely going to be swinging by. I was taking a look at it the other day uh, when I was in the grocery store. I'm definitely going to be purchasing my copy here uh, soon. I, I didn't, uh, for some reason, decided to put it back on the shelf. I'm going to have to go swing by, pick it up, and really get a feel for not only the Tar Heels, but some of their opponents that are on the schedule this season uh, with some of those magazines. And then, of course, we didn't have them last year. We're hoping that we can get them on this year. Uh, once again, after we had them on back-to-back -back years, uh, the prior two seasons, we're hoping to get Phil Steele back on, the man that writes the college football Bible, one of the most accurate guys out there. We're hoping he'll be able to stop by with us. And, of course, the guy that was with us last year that did stop by and helped us preview the Tar Heels season, Brett Ciencia of Pick 6 Previews. We're hoping to get him back on as well. So, uh, you know, plenty of great content for you guys to keep up with here on the podcast. And there's plenty of different places you can check it out, uh, whether it's uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, uh, plenty of different places. There, the, the podcast is just about everywhere. It's also on the website. So make sure that you guys rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to the podcast. We greatly appreciate it. That, re, uh, appreciate that rating and reviewing. Uh, sort of for us, kind of helps us, uh, you know, adjust some of the things that maybe we need tweaks on. Also, we'll sort of help uh, the podcast move up some of those rankings, get recognized. Uh, you know, when people search uh, Tar Heel Podcast, everything like that. So people that haven't tracked us down just yet can and won't miss any of these great editions that we've got coming up. And you guys won't either if you hit that subscribe button. That means it'll go right into your podcast library so that you can listen to the latest edition whenever it comes out. As I mentioned, HeelToughBlog.com, that's the place where you can check out all of the great articles. Uh, the podcasts are up there as well. You've got the two tabs at the top, Heel Tough Blog Podcast. We've also got the Four Corners Podcast up there. Uh, that's the basketball side of things, so you guys can check that out as well for all the off-season storylines that we've been talking about there. Uh, it was rebranded, of course, after the Roy's, uh, after uh, the Roy's Voice Podcast was retired following Roy Williams' retirement, so uh, it is you know, in the same feed, if you were subscribed to the Roy's Boys uh, podcast feed, uh, you are still subscribed to the Four Corners podcast. The numbers uh, on the episodes have reset as well, so don't be alarmed by that. Uh, that is the same podcast. It's the same host. It's just a rebrand, so uh, make sure that you guys are listening to that if you've been subscribed for a while. It's uh, still great. We've uh, you know, added a couple things as well, so uh, there's some really great content coming up on that side of things. Uh, you know, On the website right now, uh, it is going to probably be pretty football-heavy over the next couple of months. There'll probably be some occasional basketball articles that go up. Uh, uh, you know, definitely in terms of, uh, of some recruiting stuff once they get into AAU season, but uh, football is going to be hit hard and heavy here when the dead period opens, uh, you know, is officially lifted and everything opens back up on June 1st. Uh, that is when, you know, look, there are going to be some guys that are going to be on campus. I mean, you're talking about one of the biggest players in the entire country. The top offensive lineman in the country, Zach Rice, is going to be on campus for the Tar Heels on June 1st. It's an unofficial visit, but that's just the start of what is going to be a crazy month of June. We'll have you covered on the Heel Tough blog website throughout that month of June. Plenty of articles, plenty of reaction to everything that happens on there. And of course, if we get that commitment, we will have you covered on that front as well. There's some great articles up there right now that you guys can check out uh, and when it comes to the recruiting stuff. Also, continuing those scouting report articles. So a lot of those guys that are going to be on campus, if we haven't scouted them yet, we're going to go back, look at some of their games from uh, either the fall of 2020 or this past spring season that they played here in 2021, and we'll give you a breakdown of what to expect from that player 
if they were to commit to Carolina. Some of the recent ones that we've done, Andre Green Jr., the four-star wide receiver uh, out of the state of Virginia is up there. Uh, that one just went up a couple days ago. Connor Harrell, that's the most recent one. He is also the Tar Heels' most recent offer, a three-star dual-threat quarterback in the class of 2022. Uh, comes out of the state of Alabama uh, from Thompson High School, one of the better high schools down there. Uh, so some really great stuff up on him. Him. And then uh, coming down the line here in the next couple of days, we'll have Jaden Lucas going up as well as Zach Rice, uh, the guy we just talked about, going to be the first guy to come on campus on June 1st when that dead period is lifted. So uh, we're going to have a bunch of that stuff going up for you guys. So make sure that you guys are uh, you know, keeping an eye on that website, HeelToughBlog.com. The best way to do it, as we've always said, is through those social media feeds. Facebook is where you can find everything, whether it's the articles, the podcast, the video editions of the podcast. Those are coming back this year. We've got our studio back. That's right. You're going to be able to see uh, our mugs on camera. I know that's not the most exciting thing, but uh, yeah, we're going to be breaking that stuff down this year. We're going to have our studio back. There'll be uh, you know, a great backdrop, everything like that that's going to be coming back. So a lot of exciting stuff that we're going to be doing for this season of Tar Heel Football, one that is expected to be a big one. The Facebook page, as I mentioned, is where you can keep up with all of it. Heel Tough Blog on Facebook. If you want to follow us on Twitter as well, where we put all the articles and podcasts, uh, you can follow us there at Heel Tough Blog and the personal uh, Twitter accounts. It's at HTB Anthony for me, at HTB Josh for Josh Marlowe, the normal co host of this show, the lead host of the Four Corners podcast, and then our recruiting analyst, who we're going to be hearing from probably a lot over the next couple of weeks, couple of months, Zach Hubbard, is on Twitter at HackZubbard2. So that wraps up for this edition of the podcast. want to thank Bill Span for stopping by with us. want to thank you guys for listening. And as always, go Tar Heels!